In his lifetime, Charlie Chaplin would explain his reluctance to allow people on his set or to share his working secrets by saying, if people know how it's done, all the magic goes. Perhaps a truer reason was that he himself came more and more to feel that he was unable to unveil the mysteries of his creation, simply because the essential part of the mysteries remained veiled for him also. How could he ever explain to himself or to anyone else the seemingly accidental creation of the character that was to become the most universally recognised representation of a human being in the history of art? And that's a quote from David Robinson, who wrote the introduction to Charlie Chaplin's autobiography. And this was the book that I read in preparation for this special episode of Icons. And for those of you who are new here, Icons is a podcast where I dive deep into the process and philosophy behind the works of great artistic masters. But when I usually do just that, I do so by reading the biography of an artist. But it's something else to read an autobiography, especially one as well written as Charlie Chaplin has done so. A man who would, without proper schooling, teach himself a new word a day. And believe me, he made full use of that rich vocabulary. And uh, whilst the introduction notes Charlie's inability to speak to exactly how enormous an impact he had on both comedy and film, his attempt is wonderful and carries with it a masterclass of insights for any creative. I am very excited about this episode. I think it's the one that's got the most packed in insights in terms of creative process. So for those of you who really listen to icons for exactly that, you're going to get a lot from this. That being said, I admittedly knew very little about Charlie Chaplin until I read this. To me, until I read the biography, he was more of a character than he was a man. It was difficult for me to discern the difference of Charlie Chaplin and then this character figure that we've probably all seen and the image that probably comes to your mind when I say Charlie Chaplin. He's someone I laughed to many times growing up. My mother was a big fan of Charlie Chaplin, so showed me a lot of his films on DVDs. They may have even been some of the earliest DVDs that I even had as a child. But in reading this autobiography and learning of the man who impacted cinema so greatly, I discovered many surprising things about him. I learned that he was shy, sometimes awkward. He's extremely sentimental. I mean, he, he, he vehemently hates goodbyes. He adores the beauty in women, but then he's awfully blasé about marriage. And yet, ultimately, it's what comes to me as unsurprising about someone who may have had this kind of impact that actually has captured me most and what we'll be kind of getting into most. Because he is a man enthralled by his art and by art in general, to be honest. Someone who has an extremely conscious grasp on creativity and the process it demands of us. The first third of his autobiography recounts his hard childhood, living mostly in workhouses with and without his brother Sidney. His father, a drunk, died at 37 and his mother, despite being a great inspiration to him, having been a stage actor, moved in and out of mental asylums. And I still highly recommend learning about this by reading this wonderful autobiography. But it's from the second third of the book that begins to highlight some of the gold for us to learn from. Starting from the moment he joins Keystone Film Company, the first film production studio that he works with. Charlie Chaplin uh, is hired by Mark Sennett, who was the producer who worked there. And Mark Sennett had actually seen Charlie Chaplin perform on the stage one night in New York at the American Music Hall years earlier. He was drunk at the time, but luckily he remembered Chaplin as this animated figure and said to himself that when he was a big shot one day, he would hire this person immediately and sign him to his uh, company. And so he does exactly that. And thank God he did, because well, after having wrapped his first film, Chaplin waited around Senate set hoping to be seen and lo and behold he did and biting his cigar he instructed Chaplin to put comedy makeup on he says anything will do you know we just need some gags here and Chaplin recalls this moment in the book he says I had no idea what makeup to put on however on the way to the wardrobe I thought I would dress in baggy pants big shoes and a cane and a derby hat I wanted everything to be a contradiction the pants big the coats tight the hat small and the shoes large. 
I was undecided whether to look old or young, but remembering Senate had expected me to be a much older man, I added a small moustache, which, I reasoned, would add age without hiding my expression. I had no idea of the character, but the moment I was dressed, the clothes and the makeup made me feel the person he was. I began to know him, and by the time I walked onto the stage, he was fully born. This, of course, is the origins for the famous outfit that we know Chaplin to have worn in his films, giving him one of the most recognisable silhouettes in artistic history. If we continue from the book, it says, When I confronted Senate, I assumed the character and strutted about, swinging my cane and parading before him. Gags and comedy ideas went racing through my mind. And after getting an incredible reaction from Mark Sennett, a bodily laughing for everyone on set to hear, Charlie Chaplin explains to Sennett his newly created character. We'll go back to the book here. You know, this fellow is many-sided. A tramp, a gentleman, a poet, a dreamer, a lonely fellow, always hopeful of romance and adventure. He would have you believe he is a scientist, a musician, a duke, a polo player. However, he is not above picking up cigarette butts or robbing a baby of its candy. And of course, if the occasion warrants it, he will kick a lady in the rear, but only in extreme anger. Senate continues to laugh and loves it and challenges Chaplin to see what he can do with it. And this character, known as the Tramp, or sometimes the Little Tramp, was extremely successful. And I mean that, of course, both in creating an impact within the studio from the very beginning, but also, as we all know, in birthing a character that will forever change the way of comedy in film. In the book, Chaplin says, With the clothes on, I felt he was a reality, a living person. In fact, he ignited all sorts of crazy ideas that I would never have dreamt until I was dressed and made up as the tramp. And after this moment, Chaplin makes a promise to himself. He says, As the clothes had imbued me with the character, I then and there decided I would keep this costume whatever happened. And with that, let's begin this episode of Icons where we'll explore the creative lessons bred from studying the exploding comedic artist, Charlie Chaplin. And seriously, there are so many incredible lessons for any creative. And in this episode, we'll cover his high standard of work and his desire to do everything himself, how he added additional dimensions beyond comedy to his art, the Russian and Italian artists that moved him, how he managed to be so incredibly productive. You'll be shocked when you find out how many films he's made, by the way. How he got his ideas, his thoughts on acting, and what any artist can learn from it, and how he tackles creative problems. And as always, all the art I mentioned throughout the episode is listed in the description, so there's no need to frantically Google everything as you listen to this. Charlie Chaplin had an extremely high standard of work by placing story and the need to make audiences laugh as king of every decision. You know, he realised that not everyone had this as their priority, and he seeks out the ability to have more creative control and to do everything himself because of this. So before that fateful day where Chaplin first puts on his costume that would define his image, as we mentioned earlier, Chaplin's first film role actually came from working with Keystone's top director, Henry Lerman, who heard Charlie Chaplin play a newspaper reporter. And as it was Chaplin's first time working with Keystone, he was eager to impress. He says, I was anxious to make suggestions. This was where I created antagonism with Lerman. In a scene in which I had an interview with an editor of a newspaper, I crammed in every conceivable gag I could think of, even suggesting business for others in the cast. Although the picture was completed in three days, I thought we contrived some very funny gags. But when I saw the finished film, it broke my heart, for the cutter had butchered it beyond recognition, cutting in the middle of all my funny business. I was bewildered and wondered why they had done this. There are numerous moments like this, by the way, when Charlie Chaplin's comedic acts are cut from Lerman's films, and in response, Still wanting his jokes to land in the final cuts of the film, Charlie got creative. He says, Familiar with the method of cutting films, I would contrive business and gags just for entering and exiting from a scene, knowing that they would have difficulty in cutting them out. You know, he became familiar with these methods, particularly in editing, as he studied and observed all parts of the film creation. He watched the edit, becoming knowledgeable about film roles, he used all of his time to do this, even between films, noting that he had hated inaction. He said, 
I took every opportunity I could to learn the business. I was in and out of the developing plant and cutting room, watching the cutter piece the films together. And the thing is, whilst this helped inform how he would sneak his comedic ideas in as a performer, you never get the sense really that he wanted to just be an actor. And I think by watching the cutting and realising he can do it for himself, a lot more came to his mind. In another story, Chaplin describes his time working with director Mabel Normand. And Mabel Norman was a young director who just started directing. Yet when Charlie had ideas for how to make the film even funnier, he was constantly shut down. We were on location in the suburbs of Los Angeles. And in one scene, Mabel wanted me to stand with a hose and water down the road so that the villain's car would skid over it. I suggested standing on the hose so that the water can't come out. And when I look down the nozzle, I unconsciously step off the hose and the water squirts in my face. She told me to shut up quickly. We have no time. We have no time. Do as you're told. And whilst the idea he presents is great, it is now what we can see as a very Charlie Chaplin-esque idea. But this inability to add his own ideas frustrated Chaplin. So he relented. He says, I'm sorry, Miss Normand. I will not do what I'm told. I don't think you are competent to tell me what to do. He actually notes here that he even had to overcome his own attraction for her. He says, now she sat by the camera bewildered. Nobody had ever spoken to her so directly before. I was also susceptible to her charm and beauty and secretly had a soft spot in my heart for her. But this was my work. Which might seem silly, by the way, but considering how much Charlie Chaplin throughout the book would fall constantly for beauty throughout his life, this is actually a very big deal and also highlights the importance of his work to him. Of course, after this, Mark Senek, the producer, comes running to Chaplin's dressing room where the two of them have an argument regarding Chaplin's ability to cooperate. Chaplin relenting that the story required gagging up, as he says. The argument then continues to the next morning, but in a slightly different tone, because Charlie suggests that he is attempting to be cooperative, but that Senek might find that he'll have better success if he were to let Chaplin direct himself. And Senate says to this, who's going to pay for the film if we can't release it? And I'm reading from the book now. I will, I answered. I'll deposit $1,500 in any bank. And if you can't release the picture, you can keep the money. Mac thought for a moment. Have you a story? Of course, as many as you want. All right, said Mac. Finish the picture with Mabel, then we'll see. We shook hands in the most friendly manner. Later, I went to Mabel and apologised, and that evening, Senate took the both of us out to dinner. The next day, Mabel could not have been sweeter. She even came to me for suggestions and ideas. And whilst there could be a lesson here about finding compromise and collaborating well, I believe the real unique lesson here is Charlie believed in his own ability, so much so that he was willing to financially back himself and for the entrepreneurial or creative listening, someone who's eager to work for themselves, uh, but finding themselves stuck, you know, working for someone else's vision, you must at some point wonder if you are willing to back someone else's work so much, but not yourself. Why is that? And in regards to the cutting of Chaplin's jokes, uh, Chaplin actually writes in his book, Henry Lerman confessed years later that he had deliberately done it because as he put it, he thought I knew too much. And although we learnt that ultimately it goes well for Chaplin, this moment is evidence that Chaplin broke a fundamental law of working with others. And this law would be captured by author Robert Greene, who in his book, The 48 Laws of Power, notes that we should be very wary of appearing better than those whom we work for. I've noted here that Greene writes, Everyone has insecurities. Even when you show yourself in the world and display your talents, you naturally stir up all kinds of resentment, envy, and other manifestations of insecurity. And with all those above you, outshining the master is perhaps the worst mistake of all. What you run the risk of here by outshining the master, as Robert Greene articulates, is having a very powerful enemy. Someone who by their seniority can act against you or even blackball you out of spite and, and if you retaliate usually due to their higher positions they're likely to have way more leverage than you so your your word will have very little power when pitted against theirs and so an insight for us is to assume that we're not chaplain and to take note of those above us who display any qualities of insecurity because no matter how much they may have you in their favor 
you will always run the risk of being out of favour with them in a big way. But to be fair, if your talents are being stifled and you can't stand it, an even better way of avoiding this entirely is to assume creative control of your work as Chaplin did. Throughout his career, Charlie Chaplin holds a high standard to his work, often getting frustrated that he could perform something better than the actors that he was witnessing. He would actually go on to direct the actors for every moment, which is stressed in the book, but also seen in a short, wonderful 30-minute feature he made called How to Make Movies, which I highly recommend you watch. You know, even for the female characters, he, he felt that he could do them better, and so he would just go ahead and, and act on their behalf, show them how to do that, and, and that's what they would perform. It's a really fascinating process, very dictatorial, but it, it comes out with great prevail. And here's the thing, Chaplin's control over the creative process even extends to the music, as he composed all of the music to his final full-length feature films. In fact, I recommend just going on your streaming service, typing in Charlie Chaplin, and just allowing yourself to be immersed in the mood of some of the works that he created. They are great standalone soundtracks, let alone the fact that they perfectly match the mood of the feelings he was trying to produce in his films. And to really hone in on this creative control, he says, Thereafter, I had stipulated in every contract that there should be no mutilating, extending or interfering with my finished work. He really made sure that his creative control had legal strength too. And here's the thing, rarely can we say that a film director did everything in a film. In fact, we're often a little grossed out, right? If, if we believe a director believes that they can do everything themselves, knowing that there was lots of collaborative talent that's obviously required to make a film. And, and Christopher Nolan, the director, actually said most recently in his humble first Golden Globe win acceptance speech for Best Director that I can only accept this on behalf of others. As directors, we bring people together and we try and get them to give their best. But here's the thing. With Charlie Chaplin, I think it's different. This man came up with the ideas, wrote the scripts, at some point even financed entire studios to be made. He did the placement for camera, he acted, he helped other actors perform, edited and even composed the music for his films. So creative control was very much utilised there and you can see the singular vision of Chaplin's work executed in every single one of his films. And so here's the thing, with this creative control, Chaplin took what people already knew of silent comedy films and began to experiment by adding new layers. Whilst working at the Keystone Film Company, Chaplin notes discovering his desire to do so. He says, I can trace the first prompting of my desire to add another dimension to my films besides that of comedy. I was playing in a picture called The New Janitor, in a scene in which the manager of the office fires me. In pleading with him to take pity on me and let me retain my job, I started to pantomime, appealing that I had a large family of little children. Although I was enacting mock sentiment, Dorothy Davenport, an old actress, was on the sidelines watching the scene. And during rehearsals, I looked up and to my surprise found her in tears. I know it's supposed to be funny, she said, but you just make me weep. She confirmed something I'd already felt. I had the ability to evoke tears as well as laughter. And a side note here is actually when he talks of pantomiming to appeal to, to emotions, his ability to enact exaggerated expressions needed to convey how he felt in silent films was second to none. Other filmmakers who love Chaplin's work would go to say that the reason his work is so good is because they didn't even need sound. It's, it's not that they were silent because of the constriction of technology. In fact, there was a time period where films were starting to have sound, but Chaplin continued to make in silent because he didn't need the sound. Every emotion was felt through the screen. You could watch the films with the sound turned off without even the music and know exactly what's going on. This kind of ability to convey inner emotions so well reminds me of Leonardo da Vinci from the last episode in episode four, where he would even examine deaf people in being able to determine what the outer movements that conveyed in emotions so well was. And the thing is, when we were watching a Charlie Chaplin film together in preparation for this, my girlfriend even noted that even though it's silent, so much is being said. The actions, particularly from Charlie's character, are subtle but loud. And we'll speak more about the qualities that Charlie thinks are essential for an actor later on. But for the time being, this ability that Charlie had to add tear-inducing acts to his comedies is true. 
ultimately it's what allowed Charlie Chaplin in my eyes to move beyond creating comedy to creating true art. It's why he's a master icon that I'm covering. His ability to create deeply sympathetic characters that could move audiences was a very unique thing at the time and really went to change the genre. Whether it's in The Kid, which is a wonderful film where the tramp character takes on a young orphan to keep him out of a life in the orphanage or City Lights where he befriends a blind flower girl and goes through a journey with many obstacles to make money as he pays for a rent or helps pay for her eye surgery restoring her vision only to have sacrificed his selfish desire to keep up the illusion that he was a rich man worth dating whilst the girl was blind. This results by the way in a beautifully rich and yet ultimately heartbreaking expression on Chaplin's tramp that ends the film magically. So highly recommend watching City Lights. But there is this account of the debate he has with an author and the short story writer Governor Morris, or Govey as Chaplin would, would call him in the book. The debate prompted by the fact that Govey stated that the feature film The Kid that Chaplin was working on would not work, saying that the form should be pure, either slapstick or drama, stating that Chaplin couldn't mix them. But Chaplin to this says to Govey, as we've got here in the book, the transition from slapstick to sentiment was a matter of feeling and discretion in arranging sequences. And Chaplin continues to say, I argued that the form happened after one had created it, that if the artist thought of a world and sincerely believed in it, no matter what the admixture was, it would be convincing. I love this. The crafter of the art, if believing in their own vision enough, can kind of find and create a piece with whatever mixture they want. I, I love that. And today we know that blending and mixing of genres and seemingly separate emotions is something that allows artists often to transcend their genre. I immediately here think of artists like Kendrick Lamar or Childish Gambino or Quentin Tarantino, the Coen brothers, you know, these are all people who did exactly that. And even in the realm of sentimentality within comedy, not only is that true of Chaplin's later films, but this is also true of the contemporaries, the modern contemporaries like Rowan Atkinson's Mr. Bean. So an insight for us here is don't fear mixing unusual combinations. And if you think that comedy and heart isn't an unusual combination. Remember, that's only the case now because Charlie Chaplin made it so. But where does this desire, this, this want to make films better than we knew them to be come from? And where does it continue to arise as Chaplin continues his career? Because his work only gets better. It's likely that from reading this book, it came from the fact that he admired emotional depth in the art that was not his own. And I love reading each account in the book that has him speaking about an artist or a performance that he adores because there's lots of them. And I'll, I'll read you a few examples. You know, at one point he's talking about the art of Russian ballet dancer Anna Pavlova. And I'll, I'll read you this. He says, the sublime is rare in any vocational art. And Pavlova was one of those rare artists who had it. She never failed to affect me profoundly. Her art, although brilliant, had a quality pale and luminous, as delicate as a white rose petal. As she danced, every movement was the centre of gravity. The moment she made her entrance, no matter how gay or winsome she was, I wanted to weep. In another account, he's talking about another Russian ballet dancer, Vaslav Nijinsky, and he says, The moment he appeared, I was electrified. I had seen few geniuses in the world, and Nijinsky was one of them. He was hypnotic, godlike, his somberness suggesting moods of other worlds. Every movement was poetry, every leap a flight into strange fancy. But my favourite account is when Charlie Chaplin talks about an Italian actress, Eleonora Ducci, mostly known as Ducci. And Charlie here speaks in depth about a stage performance he saw her give, where he first notes actually an incredible performance from a younger male Italian actor who he says is able to hold the centre of the stage magnificently before following up with, how could Ducci excel this young man's remarkable performance, I wondered. Then, from extreme left upstage, Ducci unobtrusively entered from the archway. She paused behind a basket of white chrysanthemums that stood on a grand piano and began quietly rearranging them. A murmur went through the house and my attention immediately left the young actor and centred on Ducci. She looked neither at the young actor nor at any other actors. 
but continued quietly arranging the flowers and adding others which she had brought with her. When she finished, she slowly walked diagonally downstage and sat in an armchair by the fireplace and looked into the fire. Once, and only once, did she look up at the young man, and all the wisdom and hurt of humanity was in that look. Then she continued listening and warming her hands, such beautiful, sensitive hands. After his impassioned address, she spoke calmly as she looked into the fire. Her delivery had not the usual histronics. Her voice instead came from the embers of tragic passion. I did not understand a word, but I realised I was in the presence of the greatest actress I had ever seen. Wow. Wow. I, I love it. I love this account so much. I love that phrase. Her voice instead came from the embers of tragic passion. I think there's something powerful captured there, but there's something in the performance that has subtlety that Chaplin actually admires and is ultimately drawn to in, in, in realising that perhaps this was the greatest performance he'd ever seen. I, I love that as well. But it reminds me of Meryl Streep, actually, who, known for her powerful, dominating roles, when preparing for the role as the fashion magazine head Miranda Priestley in the film Devil Wears Prada, she decided instead to make the creative choice of giving the powerful woman a soft and quiet voice. And she says she takes this mostly from Clint Eastwood, who's someone who, you know, despite being extremely intimidating to a lot of people, actually, when directing, speaks very quietly. I've heard Tom Hanks also speak to this as well, where he would direct people not by saying action, but rather just saying, please begin or do continue or something, you know, something soft and gentle. But Meryl Streep actually says about this, that the less people raise their voice, the more people have to lean in. And I can easily contrast this because there's like a need instead to lean back when you feel someone's attempting to dominate your space. There's a natural inclination we all have when it comes to power. We think that it comes from the strength to speak up and, you know, to command a room with a bellowing echo. But the problem is this voice runs the risk of being predictable, even annoying. But the quiet voice, despite having its own problems, never runs the same risk. Robert Greene, actually, in The 48 Laws of Power, would write, the more you say, the more common you appear, and the less in control. Powerful people impress and intimidate by saying less. So it is true, therefore, that a power can be found in the quieter, more composed performances. And I think immediately of the opposing characters of Vincent Hanna and Neil McCauley, played by Al Pacino and Robert De Niro, respectively, in one of my favourite films, probably the best action film of all time, Heat, directed by Michael Mann. And here's the thing, Al Pacino gives an incredibly memorable performance, shouting and demanding attention. But I think De Niro takes the edge during the film by giving a career peak performance. He has this relaxed tone with it the entire time. It carries with it a kind of subtle sadness despite the apparent confidence he has in his beliefs he quietly pontificates throughout the story the thing is this actually manages to perfectly reflect the conflict at the heart of the film of whether a dogged pursuit of a craft can be had alongside a normal person's life but charlie chaplin would say in acting i like subtlety and restraint so no wonder, despite not understanding the words being said, Chaplin felt a deep and powerful presence from Eleonora Ducci's voice. And the insight here for us, of course, is to fill your days with art. You know, allow yourself to be at awe, then reflect on what quality in the art you love moves you, then use that, just like Chaplin did. And my God, did he move his inspiration into productivity. You know, a fun fact, Charlie Chaplin directed 72 pictures during his career. This is not a Leonardo da Vinci type of artist who gave himself time to explore his curiosities across different disciplines. Charlie Chaplin made films and he made a lot of them. 
It's worth noting that when you hear 72 pictures, by the way, you, you may think of them all as full two hour feature length films. But the original films he was producing were one or two reels of film, as he mentioned. So a, a reel being able to hold up to 11 minutes of footage or so. But that being said, in order to make 72 pictures, he obviously had to have a lot of ideas. And before we get to how he got his ideas, let's first explore how he utilised them. Charlie talks in the book about the very moment he began directing his own films and how he immediately noticed creative opportunities to be exploited. He says here, there was a lot Keystone taught me and I taught Keystone a lot. In those days, they knew little about technique, stagecraft or movement, which I brought to them from the theatre. They also knew little about natural pantomime. In blocking a scene, a director would have three or four actors blatantly standing in a straight line facing the camera and with the broadest gestures, one would pantomime, I want to marry your daughter, by pointing to himself, then his ring finger, then to the girl. Their miming dealt with little subtlety, which we know is very important to him, or effectiveness, so I stood out in contrast. In those early movies, I knew I had many advantages and that like a geologist, I was entering a rich, unexplored field. This is beautiful. I love, I love this. I would say, though, that this was unlikely to be simply a lack of competence from everyone working at Keystone, but rather a, a product of the imaginative eye that Chaplin had. This was an eye that, you know, as we learned earlier, was at awe of masterworks. And because of this inspired nature, he could feel that there was more potential wanting to be uncovered. Throughout the autobiography, despite there being mention of financial success from the films time to time, Charlie never makes the business of filmmaking feel like a business. In his eyes, he was always making the best possible art. And the thing is, even directing wasn't necessarily about being in control for control's sake or for the financial gain but for the exciting, uncapped nature of being able to express his ideas in their most unfiltered form. You know, in his own words, I suppose that was the most exhilarating period of my career. I was on the threshold of something wonderful. And here's the thing, that the anxieties that Charlie might have experienced by being a first-hand director were immediately soothed by a process that Chaplin notes Keystone had laid out for him. Chaplin actually thanks Mark Senna in the book, who said to him on his first day at the studio, we have no scenario. We get an idea, then we follow the natural sequence of events. And so, whilst working at Keystone, creatively, Charlie Chaplin had all these very simple starts, either in one gag that would inspire the making of an entire plot, or the time that actually he had a set built of a cafe. He actually notes that although I hadn't a story, I ordered the crew to build an ornate cafe set. When I was lost for a gag or an idea, a cafe would always supply one. I love that. And, and actually, sometimes even a title was just enough. You know, he, he comes up with this title, His Night Out. And he says, this would be about a drunk in pursuit of pleasure. And this was enough to start with. And about this early time, the process of working at Keystone, Chaplin actually says here, creating this way made films exciting. In the theatre, I had been confined to a rigid, non-deviating routine of repeating the same thing night after night. Once stage business had been tried out and set, one rarely attempted to invent new business. The only motivating thing about acting in the theatre was a good performance or a bad one. But films were freer. They gave me a sense of adventure. And this last line in particular reminds me of the moment that Anthony Bourdain in, in the third episode of Icons found creative freedom and expression in making TV, where his producing partner, Chris Collins, speaks of him beginning to understand, you know, I can actually have fun with this. I can do something that has meaning. And Bourdain would actually start to call the art of filmmaking something that originally he thought he would hate, but eventually ended up loving, a big crayon box. And this process, by the way, of having one idea and just allowing a film to kind of come out of it, it, it feels too simple, right? And I thought so too when I was first reading this. But here's the thing, Chaplin, despite having a few occasional challenges to it, actually kept this way of allowing little prompts to be the catalyst of grandeur to stay with him throughout his entire career and is even the creative approach responsible for some of his best work. In completing one of his masterpieces, The Kid, the film that I mentioned earlier, Charlie Chaplin found himself in what he called a state of quiet desperation. 
So at this point, he wanders through the property room, the prop room, if you will, in the studio he was working at, looking through old props in hopes of finding something that might give him an idea. And there were remnants of, you know, old sets, a, a jail door is mentioned at one point, a piano he plays with for a while. But then he catches his eye on a set of golf clubs, old golf clubs. And he says, that's it. The tramp plays golf. The idol class he immediately comes with the title. And 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 the next film was The Idol Class, which captures one of Charlie Chaplin's most brilliant and inventive plots, by the way, where ch- the tramp indulges in all the pleasures of the rich. He travels under the train rather than inside them. You know, he plays golf with balls he finds on the course. And I think the insight for us here from all of this is that whilst we're speaking on the back of the perfectionist that was the Leonardo da Vinci episode I just covered, who died next to his unfinished painting, so so really was a true perfectionist that constantly came back to his work, Chaplin teaches us a different lesson. He teaches us to not allow the need for things to be perfectly mapped out to get in the way of us creating. Instead, we should start as Chaplin did, with a simple idea or a prompt. Then just see what could come of that idea by exploring, by doing. But remember, if this process meant that all he needed was an idea to start, then how exactly did Chaplin get all these ideas? Well, that's something that I had on my mind, and luckily Chaplin speaks directly to this in the book, and he does so beautifully. He, he talks about his main method of getting ideas. And he says he wills them. He says in the book, I've discovered that ideas come through an intense desire for them. Continually desiring, the mind becomes a watchtower on the lockout for incidents that may excite the imagination. Music, a sunset, may give image to an idea. I would say, pick a subject that will stimulate you. Elaborate it and involve it. Then, if you can't develop it further, discard it. Pick another elimination from accumulation is the process of finding what you want. And I love this. I, I, I highlighted it and underlined it. It was very important to me. This line, elimination from accumulation is the process of finding what you want. In a sense, it still captures what Leonardo da Vinci was all about, which was about exploration. Um, but it's this idea of quickly eliminating those that don't work. And, you know, on a, on a meta career level, if you will, I think it begs of us to explore as many artistic avenues as possible in order to whittle them down to our eventual choice, similar to how Anthony Bourdain in episode three would refrain from labeling himself to stay open to new possibilities. You know, he, he says at one point that he doesn't want to work in TV. He, he would actually need to be shot if he did so. But, you know, he, he never says that I'm only an author. I'm only a writer. I'm only a chef. He instead just allows himself to pick up new labels, if you will. But back to Chaplin, he says, how does one get ideas? By sheer perseverance to the point of madness. One must have the capacity to suffer anguish and sustain enthusiasm over a long period of time. Perhaps it's easier for some people than others, but I doubt it. And I love this honest perspective on idea generation. I, I actually think of my childhood friend uh, who, who constantly has ideas. Every time I talk to him, he's, he has a new idea. And I recently was lucky enough to ask him and have him share with me how he does this exactly. How does he keep having new ideas? But he deploys a similar strategy of willing them, just like Chaplin does. But he does so just before going to bed. How he does this is that he would will new ideas by giving himself a large question and allowing his mind to freely explore. And done before bed, it kind of moves away from this notion that it has to have a productive outcome, giving you the most freedom to really explore. He'd actually ask of me one day, tonight, before you go to sleep, forget everything you worked on and just ask yourself, if I had to make a main character to a musical, what would they look like? And of course, if you're planning on doing this sort of thing, it can help to have a notebook by your bed as to not lose any of these musings as you sleep. But I've also noted here that sometimes Charlie Chaplin has an idea, but then waits for the right opportunity to repurpose it later. As far back as 1916, I had many ideas for feature pictures. One was a trip to the moon, a comic spectacle showing Olympic Games there and the possibility of playing about with the laws of gravity. I wish we got to see this film. He says, it would have been a satire on progress. I thought of a feeding machine and also a radioelectric hat 
that would register one's thoughts and the trouble I could get into when I put it on my head and I'm introduced to the moon man's sexy wife. And, he says, the feeding machine I would eventually use in modern times. And not only does he use it, it actually becomes one of the most iconic imagery from modern times. And uh, I'm so glad that, that he placed it in there. It's, it's an excellent sequence as well when he's working in the factory there. But what became clear to me from encountering it time and time again throughout the book is that although Charlie Chaplin is willing ideas, as he's mentioned, what he would also do is that he would look at everything he encountered through the lens of creating. He does kind of speak to this earlier when he says about becoming a watchtower for ideas, but he really does look at everything through the lens of creating. He befriends at one point the great actor and producer of the silent era, Douglas Fairbanks, who, according to Chaplin, was the first film star to live in Beverly Hills. And Chaplin actually spent a lot of weekends there um, with Douglas. But it's in the description and retelling of Douglas's larger than life personality that Chaplin lets slip a gem about his own creative process. He says here, Douglas was creative and did things in a big way. He built a 10 acre set for Robin Hood, a castle with enormous ramparts and drawbridges, far bigger than any castle that ever existed. With great pride, Douglas showed me the huge drawbridge. Magnificent, I said. What a wonderful opening for one of my comedies. The drawbridge comes down and I put out the cat and take in the milk. I love this. And this, this moment acknowledges that Charlie Chaplin really looked at everything through the lens of creating. He can't even help but see his own films in other people's sets. And throughout the book, there are several moments, as I said, like this. And one great one is when Chaplin is recounting the many illustrious visitors that came to a studio while he was working at Mutual, which was the third studio he worked with, one of which being Ignacy Jan Paderewski, a man who became the Prime Minister of Poland in 1919, but when Charlie Chaplin met him, he was but a pianist. Paderewski had great charm, but there was something bourgeois about him, an overemphasis on dignity. He was impressive, with his long hair, severe slanting moustache, and the small tuft of hair under his lower lip, which I thought revealed some form of mystic vanity. At his recitals, with the house lights lowered and the atmosphere sombre and awesome, when he was about to sit on a piano stool, I always felt someone should pull it from under him. I love this. I love this idea that he sat at a grand recital that has all this, you know, dignity and, and pride filling the atmosphere. And yet Chaplin's laughing to himself, thinking that the chair should be pulled from under him. You know, and in fact, there's an excellent sequence of chairs being pulled under each other in the ballroom in uh, City Lights, which is a film that came out. 13 or 14 years after he started attending these recitals. So, you know, you can see here where, again, there's an implementation of ideas he's having, just witnessing sequences in day-to-day in -day life. And as I've noted now, with the majority of these icons across the podcast, probably one of the most important insights for us is to look at everything through the lens of creation. For me, I've noted the power of exactly this phenomena since I've started this podcast, because it's hard not to hold this kind of meta-awareness of my podcast whilst having experiences. It's what helps me to make so many connections to seemingly unrelated art forms in each episode. You know, it comes from encountering ideas whilst maintaining the lens usually set by the artist I'm covering for those two weeks. But speaking of holding his art at the top of his mind, there is a story that comes out of the time Charlie Chaplin first meets Edna Purviance, someone who would go on to work with Chaplin for over 37 years, that I want to tell because it both shows that Chaplin never stops thinking about his art, but more interestingly, it perfectly highlights a quality Chaplin values highly in comedic actors and in himself. There is this party, this evening party, that both Edna and Charlie attend. At the party, Chaplin starts bragging that he has hypnotic powers and that within 60 seconds he could hypnotise anyone in the room. And I will read straight from the book here. It says, I was so convincing that most of the company believed me, but Edna did not. She laughed. What nonsense. No one could hypnotise me. You, I said, are the perfect subject. I bet you $10 that I'll put you to sleep in 60 seconds. All right, said Edna. I'll bet. Now, if you're not well afterwards, don't blame me for it. Of course, it will be nothing serious. I tried to scare her, 
into backing out, but she was resolute. One woman begged for her not to allow it. You're very foolish, she said. But the bet still goes, Edna said quietly. Very well, I answered. I want you to stand with your back firmly against the wall, away from everybody, so I can get your undivided attention. She obeyed, smiling superciliously. By this time, everybody in the room was interested. Somebody watch the time, I said. Remember, said Edna, you're to put me to sleep in 60 seconds. Go, said the timekeeper. Immediately, I made two or three dramatic passes, staring intensely into her eyes. Then I came near to her face and whispered so that nobody else could hear, fake it, and made passes saying, you will be unconscious, you are unconscious, unconscious. Then I drew back and she began to stagger. Quickly, I caught her in my arms. Two of the onlookers screamed, Quick! I said. Someone help me to put her on the couch. When she came to, she feigned bewilderment and said that she felt tired. It's this next bit I love. Although she could have easily won her argument and proved to all those present that she had a point, she generously relinquished her triumph for the sake of a good joke. This won her my esteem and affection and convinced me that she had a sense of humour. I love this story and this quality to relinquish whatever she needed for the sake of a good joke and a convincing story is exactly the one the chaplain admires in Edna and it's the quality that makes her the leading woman for the long 37 years that they work together. But I think this quality is also something that Chaplin holds for himself, perhaps in the moment recognising that the art of a comedic actor is to hold themselves extremely seriously. Chaplin would say, in all comedy business, an attitude is most important. I forgot who said it now, but there is an actor who I remember in an interview once said that there should be no difference between how an actor plays a serious role and how they should play a comedic role. And that a character in a comedy should never know that they're in a comedy. They should believe what they say fully, just as though they're in a drama. And Chaplin was a man who did this extremely well. And there is more we can learn about Chaplin's view on acting. And in fact, there's some very profound ideas here. There's a story he talks about when directing the then six-year-old Jackie Coogan for the film The Kid, the one that I mentioned earlier. And he says here, of course, not all the scenes were easily accomplished. The simpler ones often gave him, Jackie Coogan, trouble, as simple scenes do. I once wanted him to swing naturally on a door but having nothing else on his mind, he became self-conscious, so we gave it up. It is difficult to act naturally if no activity is going on in the mind. Listening on the stage is difficult. The amateur is inclined to be over-attentive. As long as Jackie's mind was at work, he was superb. He notes here that overthinking, over-consideration gets in the way of flow, that someone should only be thinking about the performance as opposed to everything around the performance, if you will. And so an insight for us is to think about this in whatever domain of work we might be in. So for writers, a blank page can often cause this kind of thinking. You know, you awake early in the morning to write, you had all these grand ambitions the night before about the amazing piece you were going to put together, and yet on the day nothing. You can tell I've had this experience a number of times. It's almost like everything is both too exciting and too intimidating. And for those overthinking writers, the best advice is to do morning pages practice. This is inspired by Julia Cameron, who preaches that artists should commit to writing three pages of longhand stream of consciousness writing before writing anything seriously. This is effectively to make sure that the first thing you write that day isn't the thing that you consider to be serious. This is probably what intimidates us by looking at that blank page. And I would say the same goes for speakers. If you're a podcaster like myself or an actor who's about to speak, don't let the serious thing be the first words you speak that day. Strike up a conversation with your roommate or speak to a loved one on the phone. You know, if you don't have someone immediately available, you know, you say you're doing this early in the morning then send someone a voice note, you know, regardless of the method, give a lower barrier and get the vocal cords warmed up. But more importantly, use these practices to get out of the self-conscious mind that doesn't know if the left foot should go in front of the right foot and instead get in touch with flow and start running. 
Chaplin would actually continue in a similar vein when he speaks more broadly about directing actors when he says, In handling actors in a scene, psychology is most helpful. For instance, a member of the cast may join the company in the middle of a production. Although an excellent actor, he may be nervous in his new surroundings. This is where a director's humility can be very helpful, as I've often found under these circumstances. Although knowing what I wanted, I would take the new member aside and confide in him that I was tired, worried, and at a loss to know what to do with the scene. Very soon, he would forget his own nervousness and try to help me, and I would get a good performance out of him. Someone said that the art of acting is relaxing. Of course, this basic principle can be applied to all the arts, but an actor especially must have the restraint and inner containment. No matter how frenzied the scene, the technician within the actor should be calm and relaxing, editing and guiding the rise and fall of his emotions. The outer man excited, the inner controlled. I abhor dramatic schools that indulge in reflections and introspections to evoke the right emotions. The mere fact that a student must be mentally operated upon is sufficient proof that he should give up on acting. And this actually reminds me of a wonderful roundtable discussion that includes the likes of Robert De Niro, Tom Hanks, Jamie Foxx and, and Adam Driver, who makes this point that an actor doesn't need to feel it. We often think that the best actors are those that can really feel the emotion the best. But actually, it's not about feeling the emotion as it is about being able to telegraph the emotion for the audience to feel and that the actor feeling emotions but not being able to project them is almost wasted energy. So instead, Chaplin advises us to be relaxed as artists and often focuses entirely on what he calls orientation. He says, no matter how great his gifts, he must have the skill to make them effective. I have found that orientation is the most important means of achieving this. That is, knowing where you are, and knowing what you're doing at every moment you're on the stage. Walking into a scene, one must have the authority of knowing where to stop, when to turn, where to stand, when and where to sit, whether to talk directly to a character or indirectly. And this kind of level of preparation is something that, that reminds me of the director Zack Snyder, who is someone who demonstrates the importance of knowing how to do something before attempting it in refining and solidifying his vision, if you will. Zack Snyder actually draws himself all of these incredible storyboards in the form of shots, like drawings from the camera's perspective before each film. And this actually does two things. It helps give the VFX supervisors who work on his films in particular great reference to the overall image framing to work within but it also gives him the confidence to turn up to set every single day knowing exactly the shots that he wants. Hayao Miyazaki who we covered in the second episode of Icons does a similar thing of orienting himself within his art with his watercolour paintings that he does before making any film which helps him to establish and capture a mood you know marking this thematic beat in a visual sense so that he can play within those constraints. So I recommend we as artists do the same. The insight for us here is to relax, but to do so on the back of having orientated ourselves, to become familiar with the tools that we plan to use, sketch out a rough plan and draw the lines that you can then paint over. As Dwight D. Eisenhower said it best, plans are worthless, but planning is everything. A very tangible moment of required relaxation for Chaplin is in whenever he finds himself stumped by a creative problem. To this he would say, sometimes a story would present a problem and I would have difficulty in solving it. At this juncture, I would lay off work and try to think, striding up and down my dressing room in torment or sitting for hours at the back of a set struggling with the problem. The mere sight of the management or actors gaping at me was embarrassing especially as Mutual was paying the cost of the production and Mr. Caulfield, who was a producer there, was there to see that things kept moving. Sometimes the solution came at the end of the day, when I was in a state of despair, having thought of everything and discarded it. Then the solution would suddenly reveal itself as if the layer of dust had been swept off a marble floor. There it was, the beautiful mosaic I'd been looking for. Tension was gone. The studio was set in motion. And before I tell you exactly the line I love in this, it, it reminds me of uh, Don Draper, the character in Mad Men, in a great episode where he advises Peggy Olsen, his kind of understudy, if you will, on how to get a great idea. He says, Peggy, 
Just think about it deeply. Then forget it, and an idea will jump in your face. But the line I love from Chaplin's quote is, tension was gone. Because perhaps he was talking about the tension between him and those on set that were depending on him to have an idea, but perhaps he's also alluding to the tension in yourself to see a creative problem through. Every creative likely knows this because an open loop is created whenever you start something and it always demands closing. It's something you have to simply accept as part of the creative process. And this release of that tension can come in some of the most random moments, usually when close to rest, on a walk, in the shower, or even as you settle into bed. But usually it comes from some kind of acceptance. Although new ideas might have been willed, according to Chaplin, creative solutions require a kind of letting go. This is something that musician Brian Eno captures wonderfully in terms of control and surrender. As he says in an interview with The Guardian, control and surrender have to be kept in balance. That's what surfers do. Take control of the situation, then be carried, then take control. I want to rethink surrender as an active verb. It's not just you being an escapist, it's an active choice. And so, much like Don advises to Peggy on how to handle a creative problem, it seems that surfers handle the evolving nature of waves in a similar manner. I'm going to end here by just telling you that after Charlie wraps his contracts with his first two studios, Keystone Films and SNA, he returned to New York from his place on Santa Monica, where he learned of the contract his brother managed to secure for him, working at Mutual for $670,000 a year, which adjusted to inflation would make it nearly $19 million a year, making him one of the highest paid people in the world. This news was so big, by the way, that the signing of the contract was even flashed on Times Square that night, which Charlie stood witness in. Let's be honest, this is not bad for a child who grew up mostly living in workhouses, basically parentless and hiding from rent collectors. And yet, of this time, Chapley recounts his state of mind. He said, now I am alone. That afternoon, I walked the streets and looked into shop windows and paused aimlessly on street corners. Now what happens to me? Here I was at the apogee of my career, all dressed up and no place to go. How does one get to know people, interesting people? It seemed that everybody knew me, but I knew no one. I became introspective, full of self-pity, and a spell of melancholy beset me. I remember a successful Keystone comedian once saying, Now that we've arrived, Charlie, what's it all about? Arrived where? I answered. In preparation for this podcast, I rewatched a lot of Chaplin's films, even watching videos he made that didn't go out to being shown in theatres. So if you're curious as to what I think is the best piece of art Charlie Chaplin ever made, I've made a free downloadable PDF available in the link in the podcast show notes where I talk about the piece and dissect it. Also, for more icons, you can actually follow icons on Twitter and on LinkedIn, both links in the description, to learn, in fact, from artists that I don't cover on the podcast. And with that, I've been Justin Campbell-Platt. This is Icons. Thank you for listening.